Okay, so I think we can start. Uh, welcome everybody to Newton 1665 uh, uh, seminar series. And today we're going to have uh, uh, two talks on uh, theoretical constraints on effective field theories. So our first speaker is Francesco Riva, and he'll tell us about uh, uh, positive moments for starting amplitude uh, or this title. Microscopic bounds on macroscopic theories. <laughs> Thank you very much for the, for the invitation. So uh, uh, Michele explained me that there is an algorithm to, to, to advertise this among uh, experts on effective field theories. I, I didn't get the, the, the email, which is a sign that you guys know better than me what I'm, I'm gonna talk about. So uh, this will allow me to start straight into the topic. And um, <clears throat> it's effective field theories characterized by a scale M. And uh, in particular, I will, I will discuss about the, the two to two scattering amplitudes. And um, the idea of effective field theories is that below, they describe the theory below a, a generic uh, UV scale that I call M. And um, effective field theories can have very different energy behavior. And uh, as I will argue in a moment, <clears throat> many of these behavior can be uh, taught as consistent from an infrared point of view. And the question that I will ask uh, or address today is uh, which one of these many infrared behavior is consistent with uh, a UV theory, a quantum field, a UV theory that is itself a quantum field theory. And in particular, uh, the two ingredients that I will uh, select of quantum field theory are causality and unitarity. So I will ask which effective field theories are consistent with causality and unitarity in the UV. Let me first uh, spend a few words about uh, the infrared. And uh, um, the perspective I will take is that I will uh, be in part agnostic about uh, the UV theory. So in that sense, <clears throat> we can think as an effective field theory as being generated with uh, generic coefficients. Uh, these are represented here by their contribution to the two to two scattering amplitudes as an expansion in energy with this coefficient C0 to C infinity that multiply powers of <coughs> energy square in the forward amplitude. And um, in uh, the infrared, effective field theories are themselves quantum field theories. So these coefficients run. And indeed, when I go down uh, with energy, I hope you appreciated that the coefficients uh, represented by these vertical bars, they changed their size, okay? These uh, manifest the running in the infrared. So this opens the door to asking yourself um, whether these coefficients can be hierarchical. And uh, you all know that if I try to uh, start with a certain hierarchy in the UV, the infrared running uh, will compromise this uh, hierarchy. And uh, in fact, some coefficients that started to be zero, while you run down, they will also be generated. So the general attitude is to think that uh, quantum field theories um, homogenize coefficients. So in general, you should uh, think about effective field theory coefficient as all being about of the same order. Now, this is uh, not always true because there are uh, certain uh, other patterns uh, of Wilson coefficients, like in this situation in which uh, only coefficients of higher powers of energies are large while the other ones are small. And in this case, the infrared running has very little impact on this hierarchical structure. And the reason behind this is that there can be some approximate symmetries that protect softer patterns of amplitude. We're all familiar with the case of uh, uh, Goldstone bosons in which we have uh, a nonlinearly realized uh, uh, symmetry of the Goldstone boson, uh, pi going to pi alpha, so that the Lagrangian has, uh, is associated with derivatives of pi to respect the symmetry. And this implies that the scattering amplitude grows with at least four powers of the energy. This, oops, yeah. Uh, this is generalized to Galileans that have a more uh, structured symmetry that involves also certain powers of X. So that the Lagrangian, at least some contributions to it, uh, involves two powers of the derivatives in order to be invariant under the symmetries. And the amplitude grows with eight powers of the energy. There are also contributions that grow with six powers of the energy, but let me not get into this type of details. This thing can be generalized even more and define this idea of super soft amplitude, meaning uh, amplitude that respect this uh, extended uh, symmetry and um, have an amplitude uh, associated that grows with arbitrarily high powers of energy. 
And uh, <clears throat> as I showed before, this is re really the leading uh, behavior of the amplitude because it's protected by asymmetry. So it's, it's really natural in the sense that, uh, that we think about uh, naturalness. So to understand uh, whether these patterns that I just uh, highlighted, which are consistent from an infrared point of view, to understand whether they are also make sense in uh, the context of uh, UV complete theories, I will use an instrument that perhaps uh, most of you are familiar with, which is that of uh, dispersion relations. Most of the talk would be about the forward limit, but I will also mention extensions to it. It's a bit complex to give it in a, in a talk, but it's very beautiful to read in a paper if you have time. So um, I will work in the forward limit when the two particles um, just go ahead. The total energy is uh, associated with the uh, man the stam S, which will uh, be the variable in which I, uh, I work with. And um, <clears throat> Uh, in this context, one translates the physical properties of the amplitude associated with causality and unitarity into mathematical properties uh, of the two to two forward amplitude. So physical properties of the, of the system with mathematical properties of uh, the amplitude. And um, it is well known that uh, causality implies that the forward amplitude is analytic in S uh, up in, in the complex plane in S up to some physical singularities that are associated with uh, the real, the exchange of, of particles. <clears throat> and uh, the unitarity uh, implies through the optical theorem, the fact that uh, the amplitude is positive across uh, the real axis. So considering the complex S plane, <clears throat> The non electricity they uh, lie in, in this axis. The red ones are associated with really the particle production in the effective field theory, rescattering of, of these particles, while the blue one can also imply some exchange of uh, UV particles. Crossing symmetry implies that there is a similar non analyticity in the, uh, in the negative uh, real S axis. And in addition, there is a pole because I'm dividing the amplitude by uh, certain powers uh, of S. So there is a pole at the origin. In this context, we can think of the complex S plane as being divided in two parts. One in which the effective field theory holds, which is here, and the other one instead where uh, we don't know the theory. It's the UV theory uh, from which we only know that it's causal and unitary. So in this context, uh, <clears throat> consider this uh, integral along this contour, this arc. And in quantum field theory, there is a bound that holds, that implies that uh, for uh, sufficiently many powers of uh, S, uh, n bigger or equal than two, this contour actually vanishes. On the other hand, this contour can be deformed according to Cauchy theorem into this other contour. And the vanishing, uh, uh, and uh, <coughs> along this other contour, there is an important property, which is the fact that the integral along the real axis is positive according to unitarity. So summarizing this picture that you might have already seen, um, the, the bottom line is the following, that if you consider this integral along this little arc within the effective field theory at an energy S within the effective field theory, so smaller than, than M, which is the scale, the cutoff of the, of the effective field theory, then the integral here in the effective field theory is equal, equal to an integral, uh, a UV integral along the real axis. This allows me to define arcs, which are really this integral along this thing divided by a certain powers of, uh, uh, of N, okay? And uh, this uh, infrared representation is equal to this UV representation, integral with, uh, of the imaginary part of the amplitude, which we just uh, mentioned that it's positive because of the optical theorem. This implies that this object is positive. Arcs defined by the UV representation are positive for n bigger or equal than two. On the other hand, the effective field theory representation um, gives us a, 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 an object, a way to calculate the arcs in the effective field theory. For instance, <clears throat> at three level, the arcs are related to CN, the energy coefficients in the effective field theory that I, I, I showed you a few minutes ago. Okay, so arcs are really things that we can compute in the effective field theories. And we can explore it, uh, this uh, EFT uh, infrared UV representation to translate positivity in the effective field theory. 
This is something that I'm sure you're all familiar with, but uh, it was required as an introduction, uh, is the work of uh, um, Adams uh, et al. Adams, Arkaniana, Dubowski, Nicolas Ratazzi, sorry. And uh, it implies a consistency condition in the effective field theory. Now, let me say a bit more about this because, uh, okay, good, they're positive, but um, with a simple change of variables, we can put them in this form. Just an integral between zero and one uh, of x to the n of a uh, measure which is positive because of positivity of the imaginary part of the amplitude. These objects are called moments and uh, we are very familiar with them, electric dipole moments, uh, moments of inertia and so on. We, uh, we meet them every day. And um, in fact, for instance, a stone, an asteroid, whatever, uh, um, is a good example for this. In that case, d mu is just the distribution of mass of this, uh, of this object. <laughs> it's a positive because it's just a, a mass distribution. And think about it as just being uh, limited within a radius uh, r. So n equals zero, so no powers of x here. This is just the total mass, okay? M. And this sets uh, uh, the units, sorry, big M, it doesn't have anything to do with the UV theory, it's just the stone here. So, okay, asteroid. This sets the units of, of our uh, moments. N equal one is the center of mass. And um, it's easy to see that this is always smaller than R times M. It's uh, maximized when uh, all the mass is at the, at the very edge of this thing, right? And uh, for n equal two, so two powers of x here, this gives somehow the moment of inertia and is maximized when the thing is on a ring uh, out here. And uh, this is always smaller than r squared square times m, okay? So in this simple example that uh, we're all familiar with, we see immediately that these guys are actually bounded because we have three quantities already and only expressed in terms of uh, um, two quantities, radius and mass. Sorry, now, as I was saying, Zoom doesn't allow me to see what's below there. Anyway, I think it's, it's saying that uh, uh, we want to find, uh, the goal now would be to um, understand what are all the bounds for moments, okay? So this, uh, you have a very physical picture of some bounds of moments. Uh, and um, let's see what are all the bounds for moments. So we've already seen that Bounds on effective field theories are associated with bounds on moments. And um, in fact, there is a, uh, this is a, a well-known problem in, in mathematics, it appears from 100 years ago. Uh, and um, according to this house of moment problem, the bounds of moments can be translated into um, understanding what are the positive polynomials between zero and one. And this is very easy to understand because if you take a, a polynomial that is positive, so just, uh, uh, I mean, this is just a definition of the polynomial, some coefficients times x to the i, and I take it to be positive, I can shovel it inside my integral with the measure. And this has to be positive as well because the measure was positive, polynomial was positive. And what I get is just a condition on these arcs or on the Wilson coefficient where the alpha e were really the coefficients of the polynomial. So you see this relation between positive polynomials and bounds on the effective field theory is really one to one. So the question becomes simpler. We have a mathematical problem and our physical setup. And um, the beautiful thing is that there is a nice basis for all the polynomials which are positive between zero and one. And it's simply this one. These are called Bernstein polynomials, just for some name dropping. And um, they have this form, powers of n, x to the n times one minus x to the k. Okay, it's very simple. You, you see it immediately that this is positive between zero and one. And um, it turns out according to this Hausdorff uh, theorem that these are really all the polynomials that, that you have. And, um, and therefore we can find all the bounds on the effective field theory. They have this form where this delta k uh, of arcs is uh, uh, a discrete derivative in n. n is, uh, if you want, the, the label for this Wilson coefficient, the label for, for these arcs. So the first is uh, um, a n plus one minus a n and so on. It's, it's uh, really a, a derivative, but in this discrete index n. All the bounds are packaged in this beautiful little form. Now, um, in fact, when we talk about effective field theories, uh, sometimes 
uh, it's not so useful to have all the bounds uh, involving all Wilson coefficients, right? Because we uh, might have an experiment that is only sensitive to a few Wilson coefficients. I mean, this is the generic lore behind effective field theories. So in this context, it is uh, um, interesting to have uh, bounds that involve only uh, a certain number of arcs or of Wilson coefficients. And these, are associated with polynomials that are positive between zero and one, but they have at most degree n max. Okay, it's very very simple to, to visualize, and um, it turns out that these polynomials uh, can be written in this form. So uh, as generic polynomials squared plus x times some other generic polynomial squared times one minus x another polynomial and uh, etc. And these four terms they basically characterize the most general polynomial that we can write. Qs here have at most a certain degree that I'm, I'm, I'm not dwelling upon. Um, okay, so this is very nice because by uh, parameterizing this uh, generic polynomial, we can really find optimal bounds involving only a certain number of arcs. I will spare you a little bit the details, but uh, um, by writing these polynomials, uh, there is a very beautiful way of packaging the bounds, which um, involves these Hankel matrices. Hankel matrices are just matrices that have these symmetric forms. I wrote them here in terms of these arcs, but keep in mind that arcs are at three level, are in one and one correspondence with Wilson coefficients, okay? Um, so these optimal conditions, which I remind you, optimal meaning that they involve only arcs up to a certain extent, <clears throat> can be written in this form, positive definiteness of these matrices and these other combinations, where S is uh, the maximum scale at which, um, yeah, of the system. It, it's just energy, I can evaluate this arc, it's the radius of the arc, sorry. Let me give you a visual representation of these bounds. <clears throat> so if uh, we consider three arcs, this can be represented by this beautiful uh, banana or whatever you wanna, you wanna call it, and um, so these bounds must lie uh, inside here. Instead, if we consider a theory with up to four arcs, um, the, uh, the arcs they could, they, or with some coefficient, they must lie inside this uh, shape, which by the way is very thin when watched up from the other uh, direction. Um, you might all be familiar already with uh, the work by uh, Arkani Ahmed, Huang and Huang, which is yet to appear, but uh, <clears throat> in general, um, as far as I understand the work, it's uh, focused on finding all uh, the bounds, so not this optimal set of bounds uh, focused uh, onto a limited number of arcs. And basically, <coughs> the uh, these generic bounds, they can be um, uh, summarized as the first two conditions uh, implied here. And visually, you can uh, uh, they are uh, represented by the regions that I, I, I show here. So they are not limited within uh, the square or the cube, and they're not limited by, by the above uh, axis. So these optimal bounds um, limited to a limited number of coefficients, they, 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 they are more efficient in, in these directions. So let me give you a couple of applications at three level of, of what these bounds uh, imply. Um, the first one is to answer the question that I opened in the introduction, which is this idea of super softness. I will consider a, particle of spin zero, massless, just one single uh, type of particle, forward limit. The amplitude is in general a function of S squared plus T squared plus U squared. <clears throat> but in the forward limit, it turns out uh, that at three level, it just has this form. It's a polynomial in S squared. I will discuss loop effects in a moment, but let me just assume that three level is okay. And then the question is how fast can the amplitude grow in some regime. More visually, we know of situation in which the amplitude as a function of S square um, uh, decreases, this is uh, electron mu baba scattering, it's constant, uh, Higgs scattering, if it ever exists, and uh, uh, electron scattering in Fermi theory uh, grows uh, linearly with S square. So the question is really whether we can have amplitudes like this. In the three level approximation from these ansatz of the amplitude, we can compute the arcs. I gave the formula in the beginning and it turns out that these are really just proportional. Uh, th these are just the Wilson coefficients. 
So I can write my plot by just changing the label of the axis, uh, C2, C4, C2, C6, these coefficients here. And um, the fact that we're limited to this box means that uh, C2 is bigger than C4 in units of energy. And uh, this line implies that it's bigger than C6 and so on. So this implies that basically the amplitude, this coefficient can never dominate the amplitude. This one can also never dominate the amplitude. The amplitude is always dominated by either of the first two coefficients. So um, you can never have amplitudes, which even in a small regime are super soft. You cannot have something that at the beginning grows like S square and then for a short period is dominated by S to the four or S to the six. No, it's always S square that dominates. So for phenomenology, we don't care about all these things. These are always subdominant. This thing can be uh, also extended beyond uh, forward. I will just mention it briefly to give you a beautiful uh, colored uh, table. Basically, these are powers of S square and T. There are more coefficients, there are more bounds that um, can be plotted in, um, they involve T derivatives, but also uh, things which are, don't involve T derivatives, it's, they're a bit mixed up. Um, but the bottom line is that out of these infinitely many coefficients, there are only three that can ever lead the amplitude. Either the, the, the basic constant coefficient like lambda and lambda phi to the four, the coefficient of the Goldstone, the one with the Galileon, or all the others, and these are um, bound to be positive, more precisely, uh, this one is bound to be bigger than uh, a certain function of C2. And um, as already pointed out in this paper, but all other uh, coefficients are basically um, limited by these ones. What I showed you before was the fact that C4 was smaller than C2 in units of energy, but you can make similar arguments about all these guys here. They are always smaller. The only ones that can dominate are these ones. And moreover, as uh, it was recently pointed out and, and um, at three level, <clears throat> it turns out, it appears that also this one is uh, bounded by, by the other guys. So that in fact, it's only two of the coefficients that can ever dominate the amplitude at three level. Another application that I like very much is that of uh, higher spins. So higher spins are exist in, uh, in QCD, nuclei, atom strings, whatever. And in all these cases, the mass is always bigger than their inverse size. Inverse size in QCD being just one over lambda QCD. So is this a coincidence or is just, uh, can there be a lighter state, a lighter higher spin below the, the inverse size? You can compute the amplitude for scattering of higher spin particles. And it turns out that it grows with energy, with many powers. Uh, the maximum energy at which you can uh, uh, scatter higher spin particles, it's really their inverse size because this is how much you can uh, localize a higher spin, right? The maximum is the, their inverse size. And um, you can compute the amplitude as we did in, in this article. And it turns out that uh, it has this, uh, this um, polynomial uh, form, energy over powers of the mass. This is C2 and this is C2j and uh, Remember the relation I told you before that higher coefficients are uh, bounded in units of energy. The energy here is really the inverse size. So when you put all these together, you find that the mass is always bigger than inverse size. So higher spin are always heavier than their inverse size. It's a uh, implication of quantum field theory. Before concluding, I'll, I'd like to tell you a couple of things about uh, beyond three level and uh, um, effects of running. So I will consider just the theory of a Goldstone boson where the forward amplitude exists. And, uh, and now the amplitude has a much richer form in which there are non-analyticity associated uh, with the loops that you can compute. If you call this uh, C4 of S and this thing you call C6 of S, this is a running coefficient. And the question is whether the bounds that I showed you before apply for the running coefficients. And it's uh, useful to just change the coordinates of these plots. So instead of a banana, I like more this kind of shoe or whatever, where I just change the, the vertical axis. I took a different combination, but it's still the same type of bounds. And um, it's interesting that if you look at any of these points, uh, I mean, any point basically, I just took these dots for, for convenience, and um, I run them towards S uh, equals zero using this formula, what happens is that 
they all run outside of the three level bounds. So the answer to this question is that no, um, three level bounds don't apply to running coefficients. The arcs in fact are very sensitive to this infrared loop effect and the bounds uh, differ when we include them. And in fact, the arcs are really the tool to track running of coefficients because uh, they, uh, they really track the energy dependence according to their radius. And uh, we can compute the arcs in the running theory, in the, in the full theory, not in this three level idealized uh, nirvana. We find that the first arc is equal to C2 plus some collections that I will not discuss. The first arc is the running Wilson coefficient C4 of S, this beast here. Uh, and this is reassuring statements on the non-running coefficient and on the first running coefficients are actually unaltered just because the relation between arcs and running with some coefficient is the same one as three level. However, when you compute the second, the third arc, there is a piece that pops out in the computation just because of the arcs have, uh, uh, are sensitive to this infrared piece. And, and this loop effect can actually dominate higher arcs. All of them will have this piece. As a bottom line, instead of having this little shape that I showed you before, um, the, the real bounds of uh, effective field theories live in this colored region. The colors just denote the fact that in some points I'm very close to the cutoff, while in some other points I'm arbitrarily far away from the cutoff. So red regions are healthier effective field theories. You see from this plot that uh, some of the bounds actually became uh, stronger by very little, however, and while below here, the bounds became weaker. Now the color exits outside of the three level region. And by a lot, in fact, in fact, the C6 and this coefficient here doesn't need to be positive anymore. It can be negative. So some theories do have a regime in which they look like three level. But the fact is that there are some theories that never look three level. It would be interesting to understand more what these theories look like. I, I, I have no idea, but according to the bounds, they, they really, uh, in principle, um, exist. So let me summarize, because my time is, uh, is over, I think. Um, I uh, gave you this perspective of an infrared region in which we uh, want to understand effective field theories and uh, a UV region in which we only want to assume causality and uh, unitarity. And I showed you how this idea of uh, moments uh, and, and writing things on moments, which is also very intuitively physically, um, allows us to extract all the possible constraints on effective field theory. I showed you that there are only three or two in this three level approximation coefficients that ever dominate the amplitude. And um, in particular, that the idea of super softness is never realized. Higher spins uh, are always heavier than their inverse size. And also the idea that infrared running is important. Uh, okay, I conclude here and thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have some time for questions. Can I ask a question? Sure. Oh, yeah. Hi. So this is very interesting. Uh, um, I wanted to ask you, the, your results about the running. So now mm -hmm. you're saying, okay, running can uh, impact a lot the relationship between arcs and, uh, and the Wilson coefficient. So does it uh, affect your conclusion about super softness or not? Very good, yes. So the, um, the interesting thing is that, um, oof, um, so super softness, basically the, the, the bound of super softness are three level corresponding to this dashed line, okay? So basically um, you see that including the running, actually the, the bound that kills super softness uh, becomes stronger in the sense that I'm more within the region. So the, the conclusion of super softness uh, appears to be unaltered. Uh, at this level. I must admit that um, this uh, requires uh, certain assumptions about some corrections, which I didn't uh, mention too much here. These are uh, corrections that uh, are small according to perturbativity, but uh, in general, by an iterative thinking, you can show that, yeah, the conclusion super softness is still true and, and uh, you will never be allowed to have super soft theories. Thank you. So 
I have a little question. When you consider the, the case non forward uh, scattering, mm -hmm. so what do you use for positivity? Um, so in this case, you can still uh, um, identify some uh, positive uh, integrals, which look like moments, which are basically integrals of the um, derivative of the imaginary part of the amplitude, the derivative with respect to t in zero. And this, the derivative with respect to t in zero is known to be positive as well. So uh, those objects, they do behave like moments uh, as well. Unfortunately, these are not one-to-one -one correspondence with the Wilson coefficients that you see here, because uh, uh, it turns out that the, the U-channel discontinuity um, also depends on t. So uh, this coefficient has a weird relation. And in fact, it's, it's equal to something that is positive minus something that is positive. So it's not immediate to, to, to show that it's positive. In fact, here you see that um, uh, these guys, they can go also negative. Uh, this goes into the negative region, but only up to a certain extent. So by you have to massage this thing a little bit. It's, it's quite complicated, but eventually, uh, yeah, you find similar relations as the other one. It's just a matter of algebraically uh, putting, try, finding the, the, the proper combinations that are positive. I have a question. Yes. It's a bit of a technical one. So Francesco, Good. forgive me. So the analyticity at, at in the T plane has been shown by Lehman a long ago in, in a certain fixed S. So yes. you just analyticity in T, which I believe is uh, what you might claim to take the real with respect to T. Um, now I, I was wondering if uh, I'm not familiar. So probably this is not, if this is known if uh, as a function of both t and s, because you are using uh, analyticity in s, and then you take a derivative with respect to t. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if it, it is known that uh, this is in fact analytic, uh, the derivative with respect to t is analytic also in s at the same, I mean, both analyticity in yeah. the two plates, so to say. No, it's a, it's a very good question. In fact, uh, um, uh, I cannot answer you in general. What, what I can tell you more in detail here is that uh, uh, indeed, um, what you require to really extract these bounds is a, is a small region of analyticity for all S in, uh, in T, uh, only around the, the origin. Um, and in fact, uh, it is not obvious that you can uh, take uh, arbitrarily high derivatives and still hope that, your, that the higher derivative is, is, is also analytic in T equals zero. And I believe it is not. So indeed, uh, this thing, I, I believe it only survives uh, at three level. Um, as long as you are interested in uh, um, the coefficients that I'm showing here, which is the first derivative in T, in uh, the theory with a shift symmetry, so the Goldston boson, uh, you can show that this is also analytic. But in general, uh, this is not the case. There might be analyticities, uh, non-analyticities developed uh, in association with these co coefficients, the first derivative in T uh, that uh, compromise your bounds. So I, I, I completely agree with you. In general, uh, all these bounds um, involving T derivatives are not uh, working beyond three level because of what you just said, that the amplitude is not necessarily analytic. We're actually working on this to, to, to make it uh, uh, a bit more uh, transparent to understand exactly up to what level uh, the bounds can be trusted. The ones I show you here are okay uh, in the theory of a Goldston. Okay. So the, the usual statement is for theories with a mass gap, it is analytic in T up to 4m squared. Exactly. With a mass gap is, uh, is fine. Oh, so you're just saying for theories without a mass gap is what you're worried about. Exactly. Okay. Or, I mean, still, even uh, when you have um, the mass gap, there will be uh, effects which scale like logs uh, of m uh, and s, m over s, or things like this, that uh, despite uh, not being infinite, they can be still large can still be large and uh, alter the bounds that, that uh... yeah but you can prove the analyticity in that case yeah yeah all right that's correct i have another question mm -hmm. okay so um so you're claiming in the paper and even today that somehow these uh, these uh, bounds. Let's let's look at the forward uh, limit for for mm -hmm. example. You're claiming that these bounds are somewhat a complete set. 
Now, I would like to understand in what sense uh, it's a complete set, in the sense that uh, it's an exact, they are an exact rewriting of analyticity and positivity, or in some other yeah. sense. So very good. Um, <clears throat> no, the, um, the completeness uh, uh, assumes only positivity in the sense that we only assume uh, that uh, the imaginary part is, uh, of the amplitude is bigger than zero. We don't uh, exploit uh, uh, the full uh, unitarity, which by the way, Ma, uh, um, Joao will, will discuss about in a moment. So we only assume that the uh, imaginary part of the amplitude is bigger than zero. We don't use the full uh, unitarity as you mentioned, but uh, under this assumption, it's uh, uh, complete in the sense that there are no more uh, relations that you can find for a limited set of Wilson coefficients. Thank you. Okay, so maybe we can move to the next talk and uh, postpone all the other questions to the end. So our next, next speaker is uh, Joao Penedones and he will tell us about uh, uh, S-matrix bootstrap constraints on effective field theories. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the, the opportunity to speak here. It's really, it's really perfect to speak after, after Francesco with a beautiful introduction to this problem. So basically what I will do is to do a, a worked out example in detail of, uh, of how this works for the case of uh, pions or massless pions. But as, as he also mentioned just at the end of the, uh, answering this last question, the, the main difference is that we will do it numerically, but by doing this, we can really set up an algorithm that we extract everything that we can from uh, unitarity. Okay, so, so my talk is gonna be about this, uh, this recent paper that uh, we wrote with, uh, with Pedro and Andrea. So, so I don't need the big introduction, so I will just, uh, tell you directly the, the main result that we get for bounding these uh, Wilson coefficients. And then I will describe for you what is the idea of this numerical S matrix bootstrap. And then I will connect with the arcs because we get some bounds and uh, it would be nice if we could get some analytic understanding of the bounds we get numerically. And uh, the best we can do is to go through this uh, technology that uh, Francesco just explained. Okay, so what's the problem we're looking at? So we're looking at the Carl Lagrangian, so the effective field theory that describes pions. So we, we work in the approximation that uh, SU2 isospin is an exact symmetry, okay? So the, the Carl Lagrangian uh, is written like that, where this U is an SU2 matrix that contains the pion fields. And uh, well, the first term with two derivatives is just controlled by the pion decay constant. And then at the four derivative level, we have two possible uh, interactions that we can write in the effective Lagrangian. And they are controlled by two Wilson coefficients or low energy constants. And these are the ones that well, they depend on the precise EV completion and we want to know what are the allowed values for this constant, okay? Exactly in the same spirit that Francesco explained. So, of course, we, we look at the amplitude. So we're gonna focus directly on the two to two scattering of pi -ons. So as I said, we assume exact isospin. So that implies this structure so if you want Lorentz invariance and isospin symmetry imply this structure of the amplitude where A is a function of the Mandelstam invariance. And I wrote here in the last uh, uh, equation, what you get from the effective field theory. Okay? So the two derivative term gives you a term that goes like S and then the four derivative terms gives you terms with S squared and uh, T square, and you also have logs. So in this problem, it's really not the three level approximation is not sufficient. 
because you see that uh, the one loop diagrams that give rise to logs, they enter at the same S square order as the Wilson coefficients that we're trying to bound. Okay. And okay, you from now on I will call them alpha and beta because I don't want you to, to go from this L1, L2 to alpha and beta. You need to do a one loop computation, renormalize, choose a scheme. Okay, so this is something that depends on, on the scheme you choose. While the physical amplitude that I define here is completely uh, fixed and physical, so alpha and beta are the same for everyone, and so those are the coefficients that I will fix. Okay. Notice that it's important to define alpha and beta that I chose the argument of the log to be fixed at the scale f pi squared. Okay. Of course, if I change the scale, I shift alpha and beta. So this equation defines alpha and beta precisely. That's that's the important. Yeah, when you compare with Francesco language, so we would probably combine alpha with the log to make what he was calling a running coupling constant. Okay. So here there is no running because I already fixed the argument of the log, and then alpha and beta are just fixed numbers that I can read from the amplitude. Okay, so, so that's the statement of the problem. So now I will show you the results right away. So what are the allowed values of alpha and beta? Well, that's the picture. The light green is the allowed region and the rest is excluded. So you see that actually this is a numerical procedure, so I will explain, but there is a parameter n max that controls how good our numerics is. So when n max goes to infinity, we should converge to the optimal bounds. And we see that there's pretty much good convergence everywhere, except here at the central region where the bounds are still moving slightly as you increase n max. But even there, it's slightly, you can see quite a good convergence. And then the other thing you can see here is that there are some uh, overall features, for example, if you see in this uh, inset, which is a bigger scale, you see that basically the bounds correspond to beta bigger than zero and alpha plus two beta greater than zero. Okay. In a bigger scale, that's basically what the bounds are, but they are not the exact bounds. Okay. So this is a good approximation to the bounds, but it's not the exact bounds. And in particular, in the region of the typical size of the bounds in this region that I'm showing here, uh, the bounds differ of order one from, from this uh, straight line bounds. Okay? So, so yeah, I should also mention that if you, well, this, this requires, depends on the reference you use, but in a, in a concrete calculation, you can check that in QCD, these parameters take a value in the allowed region and rather close to the boundary, the allowed region. And uh, well, for now, the only thing I want to say, I will come back to these bounds, uh, to these naive bounds that are written here. So this would be the naive bounds that you would derive if you forget about the logs. If you just apply this arc argument to some positive some forward amplitudes that you can define in this system and not thinking about the logs then you would find this bound okay but uh, as we shall see these bounds are naive and they are not optimal and they're, they're not even obeyed as i will show in the next slide so in the next slide we will study what happens to this bound asymptotically okay so when the alpha and beta are large what happens so Joao, yes can i ask the question so yes, in, in the theory, there is no small parameter. So where is this 1% uh, offset coming from? So you mean, why is this the right scale? Well, I'm saying, why is it so small or? Uh... Yeah, this, this uh, is basically the same order of magnitude that, that you would get from naive dimensional analysis. It's like one over four pi square. You see the way I defined it. Okay. Well, you can even see it from here. You see, alpha yes. and beta, if you compare the one loop terms, come with a yes. big. Uh, so, a three naive dimensional analysis. Okay. So Thank uh, you. It's, uh, yeah, it's not a surprise that it mm -hmm. comes out like that. 
Thank you. Yeah, maybe we should have defined it with four pies, and then you would not ask this question. It's it's we chose the bad conventions. It's true. Okay, so so let me show you far away. So, for example, one thing that you can ask is what happens to the derivative of the bound. Okay, we have this bound numerically, so we can compute the derivative. And you see that the derivative goes to zero, a large alpha, and goes to minus a half, exactly like the naive bounds predict. Okay. But then we notice that we think there is a logarithmic uh, term in the bound. And uh, so for that, we actually compute the, the derivative multiplied by alpha, okay, so that we would really be sensitive to the coefficient of a logarithmic term in the bound. And of course, if you take derivatives, numerical derivatives, and then you multiply by alpha, this will be, so you see this, this mess here, okay? This is uh, different curves correspond to different values of uh, n max, like in the previous slide here, this numerical parameter. But, uh, but then at the end, using arcs, I will try to convince you that um, there is reason to believe that these logarithmic corrections are there, and we can even predict analytically its uh, coefficients if we assume some particular scaling that I will explain. Okay, so this is so this is just to emphasize that there is a lot of uh, structure in the optimal bounds beyond these naive uh, state lines. Okay, any question about the the main results? So these are the results now. My, my next uh, part is to explain you how you can get these results. Okay, so what's the idea? Well, it's a simple algorithm. There's just three steps. So first, what we do, we just write an ansatz for the amplitude that obeys exactly Lorentz invariance, crossing symmetry, analyticity, and has the low energy effective field theory, low energy behavior predicted by effective field theory. Okay, so this we just write explicitly and uh, we write the answer. And then we impose unitarity for each partial wave by computing the partial amplitudes of that this amplitude gives rise. Okay, so this becomes a numerical procedure. And then once you have all these constraints, you just implement on your computer a minimization problem of any observable you want. So in this case, we would like minimizing beta for every value of alpha. Yeah. So in a bit more detail, so I can tell you that the ansatz will have this n max, which will count the number of parameters. And then unitarity will be imposed for every partial wave up to some fixed spin L max. So these two parameters are some cutoffs in numerical procedure. So then in the end, we have to also think about this extrapolation when these two parameters will fit in. Okay. But that's, that's the logic. So let me then uh, uh, explain you like step one. How do we actually write the ansatz for step one? Well, the first one you already saw, Lorentz invariance and isospin, you just have to do that. And crossing symmetry is just a statement that this function is uh, invariant in the permutation of the last two arguments. So that's easy. Then analyticity, here we really impose, we, we assume uh, if you want Mandelstam analyticity. Okay, so the only cuts are the cuts associated to production thresholds. So what we really do is we, we take the, say, the S plane minus the cut from zero to infinity, and we map it to the unit disk, and then we write a polynomial in this uh, row variable. Okay, so if you want, well, I'll, I'll show you here explicitly. So this is our ansatz in, in full glory. So this, these row variables, they are, analytic uh, in the plane minus the cut from zero to infinity. So when you write a polynomial in these variables, you automatically impose the right analyticity. 
And uh, well, we also make it crossing symmetric uh, explicitly. It's invariant under TU permutation. And then the last thing to do is to make it correct at low energies, but that's also very easy. So we just, well, we just make this sum of the generic polynomial, this, this part here, we make it uh, very soft. So we make it vanish as uh, faster than S squared. So let's say as S to the five halves. So that's the, the next power that appears naturally at, at low energies. And then we write explicitly a function that has exact effective field theory, low energy behavior up to order S squared, including the logs. Okay. So the parameters alpha and beta appear here. And then there is all these other parameters, these Cs and these Ds, these are just numbers. They are free parameters in our ansatz. Okay. And uh, we sum up to some n max. So if we put more parameters in more higher degree polynomials, we, we have a bigger ansatz. Okay. So that's very systematic. And then uh, unitarity, we just compute partially. Well, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. Uh... Just a clarification or something I don't. I recall that we have the car plus corpse non analyticity at constant s if t becomes well outside the physical region. So for positive and complex t. So is this answer? Is isn't this too much yeah. analytical or what? Can you can you remind me? Yeah, it's compatible with, with, so here we have massless particles. So all car plus curves become trivial. They just collapse to S equals zero, T equals zero. But um, I think what you're worried is that I'm only showing a cut in the S plane. I'm not showing you like any crossed cut. Is that, is that the question? Well, the question was car plus actually, but yes, this is this, the question you're asking. I think, also another so, question. so the point here is that, um, you see, when I write these ansatz, I'm I'm writing st and u as three independent variables. Okay, so as function of three independent variables, you have only cuts like I'm showing in the s plane. Of course, now when you restrict to s plus t plus u equals four m square, right? I can even write here. I should have written that equals zero because it's massless pi arms that we're doing. Once you do that, then, uh, well, say at fixed t, you will see u cuts in the s plane because rho of u will produce cuts. Okay? But this is automatically will come out of this answer. I think what is non trivial, and that we, we had some arguments based on uh, analytic extensions of function of two variables, function of three variables, but that's a bit more non trivial is if this ansatz is the most general ansatz compatible with analyticity. That it's a bit uh, harder to argue. But that this ansatz respects the analyticity, I think it's clear, right? Just from, from the construction. So, so uh, yeah. So I think what you, what, uh, what this is the, uh, if you want a fact of, it's a primal formulation. What we do, we construct an amplitude at the end, right? We really give you an amplitude that has all the right properties and leave somewhere with some value of alpha and beta, right? We solve the primal problem. Then uh, there is a lot of work going on now to set up the dual problem where you actually exclude the rigorously some other parameter. Okay, okay let, me, let me move on. So unitarity is very simple to state. Well, you just uh, compute partial waves and then each partial wave square is a probability and it has to be less than one. Okay, so it's labeled by spin and isospin and energy or S. Okay. And uh, well, I just, wrote, oops, I just wrote here the formula for how to compute partial waves. You just have to decompose into isospin and spin partial waves, okay? So once you are here, you see, this is a set of quadratic constraints on the parameters that parameterize the amplitude. And therefore, this is really semi-definite uh, programming. So you can just put it on a computer using uh, SDPB like we use for the conformal bootstrap. 
Okay. Any question about this? So, Joao, I have a quick question. Yeah. <clears throat> this um, effective filter or the low energy part that yeah. you described, um, this is not unique, right? Because it, uh, this yeah, has values also. Indeed. As long as it has the right behavior up to order S square, and actually there's another property, you need to write it in a way such that it doesn't grow at high energies. Okay. And, so and how do you do that? Also yeah. using these row variables. But um, you choose combinations such that it matches exactly the low energy behavior at up to order S square. So you're saying that this low energy answers, when it goes into the UV, it's it's matched uh, uh, one to one with the this piece that you write. Uh, well, it, it doesn't matter. As long as it doesn't grow, it doesn't matter, right? It's something that is there. And then on top of that, you have this polynomial that can adjust and change. Okay. Change the UV. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so, so let me show you the results in a bit more detail. So the, the main issue here, the main advantage of this is that we actually get uh, the amplitude, okay? So we can, at least along the boundary, when we minimize, say we minimize beta for each alpha, we can go and see how does the amplitude look like, okay? So this is a bit of a summary. So I will show in the next slide, uh, this region here, Oops, this was not a good idea. Okay. Okay. The, the region here in yellow and the region in blue. Okay, so I will show you in the next slide and maybe we can come back after that. So I'm plotting here phase shifts for different, for low spins and iso spins. Um, so the phase shifts are plotted in uh, continuous lines and the dashed line is the modulus. Okay, so it's if you want to... And we see that as we increase... Um, um, ah, sorry, this is, this is plotted for our highest n max. And the, the point I want to make here is that if you go to this uh, yellow region here of the bound, okay, so alpha about whatever, minus 0 0.03, then you see physics, which matches the experimental data very well. For example, in the isospin one, so you see here a uh, row meson. You see the resonance of a row meson pretty much matching the experimental phase shifts. But you do not see, for example, the spin, the isospin zero is pretty badly matched. Well, if you go for to the blue region, you match better the isospin zero and the isospin two and spin zero, but there is no row meson. Okay. So I just want to say that, well, the summary is basically in the previous slide, that along the boundary, you see resonances, you list lots sorts of interesting physics like in QCD, but not exactly the full QCD physics. So on the left, you see the row meson and other odd spin resonances. And on the right, you see only uh, even spin resonances, okay? So QCD, as, as I showed you before, was somewhere up here and somehow combines both features. So it would be interesting to explore, perhaps to put more conditions, like for example, impose a row meson and then ask what is the allowed region if there is a row meson. So the games like that could be played to uh, explore this space in more detail. Any question about this? About this uh, explicit uh, results? Sorry, it, it appeared that, the, that you had them um, in the center, you said the resonance is decoupled. This is where QCD lies, is it correct or not? Well, by center, I mean along the boundary. QCD mm -hmm. is not at the boundary, you see. Okay, yeah, I see. And, and are you saying that the QCD has an alpha, which is much, much smaller than beta? Give me your dot there yeah. or not. Yes. Right. And is there any understanding of this? Uh, not that I know of, yeah. Not that I know of, yeah. I don't know. Very good question. Is there any for NDA that it's there or, or not? 
I think for MDA, they should have the same, uh, the same order, no? the same number of derivatives, quartic. I don't see any, any difference. Okay, let's uh, let's continue. You you will ask me again. I, I I wanted to just mention a bit this arcs discussion because I think it's very complementary to Francesco's uh, talk. So so suppose so in our case, yeah, I don't I don't show any pictures because this is exactly just apply the arcs logic to two forward amplitudes. So in this problem, there are two crossing symmetric forward amplitudes. One is uh, AB goes to AB with A different from B. So it's just forward scattering of different pi ions. And another one is just pi zero, pi zero, pi zero. Okay, it's just a single identical scalar. And the point is that if you compare with Francesco's formulas, you see that you have beta, this, this constants beta and alpha. Oh, sorry, there is a typo here. There's an S square missing. Start at S square. And then there's immediately the logs, okay? So if you write the arc that measures beta, there will be, so in my definition, it's really defined by the limit. So S zero is like S bar for Francesco, the radius of the arc. When the arc goes to zero, you get this part, which is of course positive because it's the integral of the imaginary part. But since this integral is IR divergence due to the log, it's, uh, the S over S, there is a, this explicit cancellation, but this part is negative when S zero goes to, goes to zero, okay? So this, maybe I'll write it here explicitly. So this term is of course positive, but this term is negative when S zero goes to zero. So this doesn't give you a positivity of alpha or alpha plus two beta. So if you forget about the logs, you get the naive bounds, but the rigorous bounds cannot be derived from here if you don't forget about the logs. And, um, and so what we did or what we noticed was that, so he, this was basically an empirical observation to try to understand the behavior of the bounds asymptotically. So here I'm plotting this combination here. So I, I just take the imaginary part and I divide by S square times a number such that it starts at one. Okay, so this is defined so, so that it starts as one plus uh, order s. Okay. So when I plot here, let's look first on the left for uh, different values of alpha. Okay, so alpha is the color. So you have different curves. But then if you plot it as a function of alpha s, not just a function of s, but the function of alpha s, you see the curves collapse. Okay, especially in the case in the lower row, especially this one here, right? You see a perfect collapse of the curves. So if this is true, so if you, if this collapse of the curves that we observe numerically, and it's actually also suggested by the structure of perturbation theory, because we can compute in perturbation theory and we see that at a given order in perturbation theory, you have higher powers of S, but you also have higher powers of alpha. So at large alpha, you expect this combination alpha S to be uh, appearing. So we can even match the first term. So if this scaling is true, you can use the previous formulas, these previous formulas that you get from the arcs to derive uh, this asymptotic behavior of the bounds, of the naive bounds, with these log corrections. And indeed, at least in the case where this collapse of the curves is very good, it matches, and maybe I can show you again, it matches what we observed here. Okay, so this, this is the prediction that we have here that this log with the right coefficient. Okay, but this is really not a proof. I think it will be extremely interesting to try to understand these bounds, at least asymptotically from an analytic point of view. And uh, I guess I'm running out of time, so let me let me conclude. So, so my conclusion is that uh, this uh, numerical S matrix bootstrap is really just an algorithm that now you can apply to your favorite theory. 
So previously we did that to the theory of uh, Brannons, so the Goldstone modes on a flux tube. And uh, now we are thinking of, uh, well, actually we are, they are working on it, on applying it to photons, to the euler ansberg lagrangian or also to gravitons. In particular, now we are doing the same uh, uh, idea to supergravity, to try to correct the higher derivative corrections to supergravity exactly in the same, in the same approach. And well, I already mentioned it, but of course it would be extremely useful if uh, a dual formulation where we get rigorous bounds instead of just finding explicit S matrices could be uh, derived in four dimensions and higher dimensions. So in, in two dimensions, it has been done recently, but in higher dimensions, it's not yet uh, published. We, we hope to see something uh, soon, but not yet. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. So we have time for discussion. So, so I have a question. So you're saying that QCD sort, sort of saturates the bound. Uh, if you take a uh, large n limit, then you will get away from the, from the optimal bound. Uh, right. Right. Then I'm asking. Should be suppressed, right? Pi and would be. No, I would be more. Okay. Would be I can more, use, more uh, weakly coupled. But uh, sorry. Just, um, no, but then even F pi, right? No, let's say that they are, you're keeping F pi fixed. So in this language, M row will go, will become uh, smaller. Right? Yes. I'm keeping F pi fixed, then, uh, then, uh, then I don't know exactly why, what is the intuition for these coefficients at large n. Mm. Um, well, what I can tell you is that the mass of the row uh, is suppressed. Think. Because from this boundary, you make a statement about the mass of the row, but uh, in this language, you don't see the number of colors. No, I don't see number of colors. It's true. Yeah, the only assumption it's, I mean, it's not even, not even as, doesn't even have to be uh, QCD, right? It's, I just assume that there is an O3 global symmetry and that there is soft mm -hmm. amplitudes. They start like, um, like S. Um, but uh, no, but I also don't know, as I said, I'm not imposing the mass of the row. What I observed, but that's, that's an output of the calculation is that if you go to this region at the boundary, so let me go there, right? So if you go to this yellow region at the boundary, uh, you see that there is a, a row with uh, the right, with the right uh, mass in, in units of F pi, yeah, compared with the experimental one. But it moves, you see? Yeah, but why we don't have any ex, any reason to expect a priori that the large n, the the real QCV for any n lies exactly at the boundary, right? So I don't think from our results we can really conclude. Uh, we can really conclude. Uh, I mean, I think this resonates a bit with the usual uh, form of bootstrap uh, where a large n uh, you are well inside the, the allowed region, uh, perhaps. Huh? Uh, while the theory with small n, they are close to the bound, to the boundary. I was wondering if it's uh, similar. Yeah, I mean, I naively, I would expect that, but um, I haven't thought carefully about that. Yeah. Yeah. Joao, a very trivial question. So what is the free theory in this alpha beta plane? The free theory meaning uh, just uh, 
the switch, switch off all interaction, you get a three massless uh, ghost on, a free ghost on. But I think this, this isn't it related to, I think, because the problem here is that uh, I'm measuring everything in units of F pi already, right? <clears throat> free just means you go to energies much smaller than F pi and you just see free, right? You see the first term. But... Um, no, I was, the point of it, I was wondering whether this should be... Uh, there should be, well, wait, three, <laughs> I don't know what to say. So three uh, massless uh, free scalars uh, are not into, into, in, in, in your answers. So this point is not in, in your plane, and this is what you are saying. Right, because I assume that the interaction, the scattering amplitude starts at S, right? So, so this must be completed then. So uh, yeah, the, the free theory point is not included. No. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> no, I, mean, I, I was referring to the fact that since there is no dependence on M, you should get something, something like a line in, in, in the, in the um, the, 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 lim the strict limit n equal to infinity should really correspond to free free no, no? Yes, in a linear sigma model you have pi square. So the first term is interactions independently of on n. Well, because there is the free n goes pi, as you were saying. Yeah, it depends on how you take the limit. Yes. Right. Joan, does the mass okay, free... so let's go in order for a second. Uh, so uh, I think we have Christophe who wants to ask a question. I then I will get back to you, Francesco. Yeah, let me ask uh, just a simple question. So what will happen to your bounds if you had some gauge interaction, like uh, electromagnetism or what we... Good question. So Right, so you would have to change. Yeah, it will change if you have uh, if you really want to consider photons, then uh, it will uh, even change the, the structure of the low energy amplitude, right? Because the, the photons are also massless, so they will go, they will affect all the way to, um, to low energy. And, uh, and in principle... Right. The SU2 answers is going to be broken because you have an explicit breaking uh, of the O3 symmetry. So the, the, the very beginning is going to change. Ah, sorry, you mean, sorry, of course. If you, if you really, you mean physically coupling uh, the, to, to the isospin uh, as a, considering the pi and one is charged pi plus, pi minus, uh, yeah, that will completely break uh, isospin, will change the answers, so, yeah. But I, yeah, I was thinking, even if you just add a, a photon uh, coupling, uh, but to, I mean, just assuming that the pion, even if the pions are an entire multiple and you treat, treat SU2 as a, some global symmetry, of course, that's not the relevant thing for physics, but uh, once, once you introduce more massless particles, all this low energy theory will be different. And moreover, for example, one thing that we, we would like to bootstrap would be just QED, right? Why don't we also study QED? But there we have other difficulties, right? Because there, scattering amplitudes, if you scatter charged particles, they are really not well defined. It's just full of infrared divergences. So, so when I, at the end in the conclusions, when I mentioned that we can scatter photons, is if we restrict just to photon-photon scattering, then it's well defined, right? Because the photon, photon-photon interactions are also soft, and there are no infrared divergences, so we can study the Euler and the Lagrangian and the higher derivative corrections to that. Yeah. Yes. So uh, next we have Sasha. Hi, Joao. Um, can, can you hear me? 
Ah, Jean? Yes, so um, I wanted to ask uh, two related questions. First is that um, oh, the, we know that also the amplitudes have uh, the, um, the uh, known behavior in the UV, so we expect that the saturated frost are bound and a fixed angle scattering. Uh, well, we have powers which can be again computed. So first question is that if you have any idea how to impose uh, this UV ingredients for the behavior of these amplitudes. And second, if you think, imagine we technically can solve this problem and we can do the bootstrap in the space of amplitudes that saturate frosts are bound, that if you have any intuition or argument that it will affect or not affect this bounds on low energy coefficients. Uh, well, as you, as you know, I, I don't know how to, how to impose the high energy behavior. But uh, also, as you know, the, the, the high energy behavior, I think in this, in this picture, maybe you cannot see too much because we, we don't go up to very high energy because, well, we're just comparing with experimental data up to around 1 GV. But, uh, but if, you plot, if you plot the phase shifts or the amplitude, let's say the phase shifts that you have better intuition up to very high energy you see that uh, as you change n max they are not really very well converged so the numerical convergence of this procedure depends on the observable so for this low energy observers alpha and beta we see good convergence so that's why we have confidence that this allowed region is the is the optimal one but uh, if you ask me what is the actual amplitude at the boundary at high energies that I don't know the numerics are very slow to convert. So the fact that we have this instability of high energy and does not affect low energy is an indication, at least for me, that if you change the way it grows at infinity, it won't really change the, the allowed space for low energy coefficients. But it's, a, it's an interesting question. Eh? It's, it's one of the reasons why it would be great to have a dual formulation. So hopefully. Francesco, you had a question? Yeah, just about the, the mass. You, <clears throat> the point you put for QCD is, is, a, is a phenomenological, I mean, it's experimental, right? If you understand. Yeah. You, your whole bounds are for N going strictly zero or? Yes, here. Right, recall. Remember, we, we had some papers some time ago where we did uh, massive pions. Okay. Uh, and okay, there are some advantages. It's closer to, to experimental reality, but uh, there are some disadvantages. It's also a third tier system. So here we were trying to do the cleanest possible theoretical system where pions are exact, bosons, bosons are, are massless. John? Hi, John. So I wanted to ask uh, about the prospects of uh, improving your analysis by your bounds, by including the elasticity of uh, so particle production and whether this case could be more feasible by using some soft theorem for the pions. You mean? Uh... You, if you if you can predict inelasticity by other means by computing explicitly, I can well, easily input that. Yeah, well, we know that there is inelasticity, and this will affect the unitary equation that you are building yeah. in your algorithm. Whereas, as, as far as I understand, you only use the two to unitary equation, right? Right. So you. But what, sorry, what is the question? So it's true that I can I can replace this one by any function of s less than one, right? If I know how much inelasticity is there, I can just do. I mean, and it can even depend on the spin and the isospin. I, if you tell me how much it is, I can put it in. Uh, but the difficulty is to do it in a self-consistent way, right? Because in a self-consistent way. 
then I would have to also include amplitudes like two to four. And that's, that's much more difficult because it's a very complicated beast. So is your question, if, if I try to do that and if it changed the bounds or this we have not, we have not tried. It would be interesting to see how much the bounds depend on, uh, on the inelasticity. Did I answer your question, Johan? Yes, partly. So, okay, well, part of the question is how they will change, and the other is, do you, do you see it is foreseeable to to somehow parameterize this uh, two to four amplitudes in the future, or we know very little about these amplitudes non perturbatively? In uh, in four dimensions, I I'm very pessimistic. I think it's really too much. So then what, what could we do to improve this analysis? We could just add some calculable, calculable inelasticity, inelasticity at low energies in the right hand side. And yes, another thing that you could do would be to, it's a bit what already happens, right? When people, fit the experimental data with, uh, with um, ANSATs that encode, uh, sorry, that have theoretical biases of dispersion relations and uh, unitarity. So if you want, this could be used in that way. Right? If you measure some part of the amplitude, you, can, you could use these ANSATs, which already obeys all the properties that we think the amplitude should obey, and then we could have a constrained fit by the theoretical expectation. Yeah, perhaps that would be something uh, something feasible. I think that would be feasible. Okay. But to yeah, to extend this S matrix bootstrap to two to n in higher dimensions, it's way way beyond our current abilities. I think if you will go to functions of many complex variables, it's really I'm pessimistic about that. Okay, so if there are no further questions, we can thank Joao and Francesco for the very nice talks. And